What's up, friends? Welcome back to What That's Good Wednesday. Happy Wednesday, everybody. I hope y'all are having a great week. And let me tell you, it's about to get better because our guest today, this girl can bring a word. She is awesome. Her name is Nona Jones. She is a very successful lady, but she will be the first to tell you all glory to God. She has a crazy story, and I can't wait for you guys to hear it. I also want to mention that over on the Ello Sister app, which you can actually download for free now, she's actually going to be speaking so much wisdom as a mentor on the app in this season. Over in the premium subscription, you can get more from Nona Jones. You can get workshops that have to do with faith, fitness, and even counseling tips. Man, our app is honestly awesome. So download it for free, get a lot of encouragement, or get the premium subscription, dive on in. But y'all, without further ado, I cannot wait to talk to Nona Jones about her new book, Killing Comparison. This conversation is directly to comparison, but also to so many other things. So if you are a girl out there struggling or a guy, I encourage you to turn the volume all the way up and listen closely. It's going to be a great conversation. Without further ado, welcome to the podcast, my good friend, Nona Jones. Oh, thank you so much, Sadie. It's such a joy to be with you. I am so stoked. Obviously, so many people struggle with comparison, and so this is just going to be a great conversation. But before we get there and into all the all the good stuff, I have to ask you the question I ask everyone who comes on the What Let's Go podcast, what is the best piece of advice that you have ever been given? The best piece of advice I was ever given um, was when I was early in my career and um, a woman said to me, Nona, read everything, Mm -hmm. read whatever comes your way, because chances are when you get into a meeting, you'll be the only person that actually read the information. (laughs) Wow. Hey, that's good (laughs) advice. And look, you got your books in the background. So so you're a reader, clearly. Mm -hmm. That's actually good advice because actually this morning, so my family's going on a, a trip soon and they were sending all of these adventures that we could do and I went and read about the adventures because I'm not about to go on some adventure. I don't know what I, I'm, you know, to expect. So I'm reading about this adventure and it's like, uh, most of the tubing is done through caves. And so you'll be doing miles in the underground. If you don't like the darkness, this is not for you. And like, if you feel claustrophobic and I'm like, okay. So all my family saying, I'm in, I'm doing, it, I'm doing it. And I text everybody, I go, Hey, I just want to let y'all know, uh, you're going to be miles under the ground with a helmet <laughs> flashlight in water. So just letting you know, none of them had read it. They're like, wait, what? None of them have read it. So, <laughs> that's actually, so funny. That's good. That's great advice. Someone said, thank you for reading the uh, instructions. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And hey, that that's wisdom right there. That's hilarious. Well, that's great Amen. advice. Um, so for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about you, about your background, your family, and Jess, who is Nona Jones? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, I was, I'll start here. Whenever I'm asked to describe myself, like the phrase that I use is I am a statistically improbable product of grace. And, and when I say that, what I mean is, you know, where I'm at now, if you didn't know my story, you would be like, wow, that's so cool. And knowing my story, you would realize, no, that's so God. Wow. So <laughs> right now, um, I'm, I'm married to the love of my life. My husband and I, we pastor a local church in Florida. We have two sons. They're 12 and 9. And um, in addition to that, I also, day to day, I work for a tech company that some of you may be familiar with. It's called Meta. Um, we own Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and Oculus and all of that. Um, and I get to do some really cool stuff there day to day. But my origin story, I think, is really the most important piece because, you know, people tend to walk into the chapter your life is on and they just assume that's the whole story. But um, I'm an only child. I was born to a mother who did not want to have children. She was Mm -hmm. actually married to my father for 13 years before she got pregnant. And when she got pregnant, she was actually really angry. And Mm -hmm. the reason for that is she grew up in a home, there was a lot of poverty, a lot of violence, and I think she just didn't want to have children because she felt like that would be a burden on her life. Mm. So yeah, she cried. My dad was super excited to be a father. He always wanted children, but halfway through her pregnancy, he got diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer Mm. and he was given six months to live. And so he was only 35 at the time. I mean, I can't imagine facing your mortality. You know, your wife is finally pregnant. You're only mid thirties. But um, he fought so hard. He lived until just like two months shy of my second birthday. 
after which my mother, she moved us to a whole other state and um, she met a string of guys who became her boyfriends. And she settled on a guy who became her live-in boyfriend when I was about probably five, five years old. Um, But shortly after he moved in, he became sexually abusive to me. And Mm -hmm. I told my mother, I think I was about seven, um, I told her about it and she had him arrested and I thought that was it. But on um, the day of his release from jail, she actually picked him up, took me with her (laughs) to pick him up and brought him back home. And so the abuse resumed again. And I share that story because I think a lot of times those of us who have survived um, abuse of all types, we tend to not talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to say, well, you know, that was then I'm moving on without realizing that everything that happens to you shapes you into who you are and who you become. So, I mean, that's my origin story. I am truly a statistically improbable product of God's grace. Wow. Wow. That's, that's wild. And you would never know that you're right. Looking at your life now and even knowing you, you are so confident, you are so beautiful, you got all these stuff going on for you. And so I think it's so amazing though, that you would share the backstory because I think a lot of people are like ashamed of the backstory, Mm -hmm. but it's actually the backstory that makes God Mm -hmm. look so good and makes you look like a miracle that you are, Absolutely, which is so incredible. Um, actually I had a quote from you It was like in the back of my notes, but I got to go find it because I I love, okay, you talked about in your book um, how humility was a superpower. And Mm -hmm. I actually want to just go ahead and start with that um, because I think that that is um, such a thing that's countercultural to today. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like humility does not seem like a superpower. In fact, that Mm -hmm. you would be the opposite of that. You know, you would come on here and you would be like, actually, like I work for this company that own like casually owns Facebook and Instagram and (laughs) and I'm a preacher and I'm this and I'm that. But instead you're like, hey, yeah, that's true. But let me just humble myself for a second and show you like the power of what God did in my life. So talk to me about that humility. Was that an aspect that you've learned to have or is that an aspect that maybe your story has kind of given you or something you intentionally seek? Yeah, it's it's definitely something I seek because, I mean, first of all, the Bible is so clear. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Mm. And if you really kind of unpack that, when it says God resists the proud, what it means is God opposes the proud. But what is pride? Pride is essentially believing that I am my source. Hmm. I am the reason why this was achieved. I am the reason why I succeeded. And um, when you have that posture in your heart, you really, you just, you don't make any room for God because you're taking all the credit. Everything that God does, he does for his glory. That's good. He does for his glory to make his name great. And so the reason why he gives grace to the humble is because he knows that he can trust the humble. That's like good. God can lift someone to a, an incredible height. I mean, I look at you, right? The reality is you're you're at an incredible height and yet you remain humble. And mm. it's not because something changed in you. It's because you were humble to begin with. Mm-hmm. I believe firmly that success doesn't change you, it reveals you. Wow, Success enables you to be more of who you already were. And so for me, humility is a superpower because it makes room for the grace of God. When you can humble yourself and you can say, you know what, everything I have and everything I am is a gift from the hand of God Mm. and you point it back to him, he knows that's a person I can trust with more because they're not going to hoard it and they're not going to take credit for what's he, what he does in, in their life. Something that has been super cool to me is looking through the Bible and seeing story after story where pieces of scripture were memorized and repeated. For generations, scripture memorization has been so important and it still is. And I honestly want to memorize more than ever and that is why I love Dwell. They make it so easy and so fun. I won't lie though, some of their verses are a little challenging each month, but honestly it makes it so much fun to do it with your family or just the fun ways that they have to memorize scripture. Like y'all, seriously imagine if you could just memorize so 
so much scripture that you're just talking to people and it's just flowing out of you. That is my goals and that's why I love Dwell's mission. Dwell is a monthly membership. Each month you're gonna receive a Bible verse memory kit full of fun things like temporary tattoos like I have right here that can make great conversation starters, a keychain and a card that has this month's verse on it. So super fun little ways to memorize verses. And I don't know about you, but I love a good family competition. So it could be so fun to see who in your family memorizes the verse first. And if you think that you're too old or too young, Dwell is actually perfect for everyone. Dwell has helped people of all ages memorize over 400,000 verses. And that is a lot. And you can be a part of that. Guys, this is so powerful. I hope you will check it out at dwelldifferently.com. You're going to be amazed at how God can use just one Bible verse to change everything. So to show you how awesome this is, we arranged with Dwell to give you your first month for free with using the code Sadie, S-A-D-I-E. It's so simple. That's dwelldifferently.com. And for a limited time only, use the code Sadie to get your first month absolutely free. That's so good. Wow. My dad actually always says, he always says, you know, people want to get famous and they think that fame will fix their problems, but fame actually just mm. magnifies really you yes. and your problems. Um, mm -hmm. You will still have the same problems, but now everyone sees you struggle through those yep. problems. And so yep. it doesn't really change anything for you. And you, you kind of talk a lot about that in your book about identity. But first, I just want to go mm -hmm. back. And so you wrote this book, Killing Comparison. And, and I think mm -hmm. that for me, certain books that I've written are specifically like, this is what I'm walking through. This is what I've been through. So I have yeah. so much to write about it. Like live fearless. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I was such a little panic attack on wheels. I could talk about being fearless or striving to be fearless and finding that through my faith in God all day long. But then when I wrote live, I wrote live more for like a specific call that I felt like the Lord said, yeah. write a book on life and that I come to give life and life to the full because the enemy's taking so many lives because people think their life doesn't matter. Yeah. So when I wrote live, I was like, I don't even know where to start because I haven't necessarily mm -hmm. lived these lies. You know, I lived the lies mm -hmm. of fear, uh, even in who are you following? I lived the lies of social media, but I haven't lived that yet. I feel like this mm -hmm. is a book for you and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like, you've walked through this. Like oh, yes. you, you've walked <laughs> through this, you've wrestled through this. And this is like, what's come out on the other side. So talk to me about just deciding to write this book. Oh, girl. Yes. This book is me. It's my story. And honestly, the reason why I wrote it is because throughout my life, I, I knew that there was something on the inside of me that was that was broken. And when I say that, what I mean is I would see other people succeed and I would feel like a failure. Hmm. And I, I, it, it didn't matter. Like, I mean, my goodness, you know, I was, I was an executive by the age of 23. I was wow. on all these 40 under 40 and 30 under 30 lists, like national publications and all this stuff. And it didn't matter. Like there was never a point where I was like, okay, finally I've made it. Mm. And so I knew something was fundamentally wrong. But what happened was um, when I really started to, to do some introspection, was right around the time when the pandemic was, you know, starting to take over the world. And I mean, probably like me, you know, a lot of speakers, their calendars were getting cleared because events right, were getting canceled. Right, right around that time, um, I was I was on Instagram one day and mm -hmm. I was getting ready to just like respond to some, you know, people's comments. And I caught a glimpse of my news feed. And a bunch of my friends, and I don't follow a whole lot of people, and I'll talk about that later why in a minute, but I don't follow a whole lot of people, but a bunch of my friends were making posts about this like huge women's conference that they were going to be speaking at that was like went virtual. And like, I knew all the speakers and mm -hmm. I knew the host and immediately I was like, why wasn't I invited to speak? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. why was I overlooked? Like, what's wrong with me? Like, why wasn't I good enough? And there was like this just cascade of thoughts yeah. and the Holy Spirit stopped my thoughts in their tracks and said to me, Nona, why does it matter? Wow. And I was like, what do you mean? Why does it matter? Like it matters because there's this huge event happening and I'm not going to be a part of it. And I wasn't invited to speak. And the Holy Spirit was like, so do you think you only matter based on the speaking engagements that you have? Wow. And I was like, well, no. I mean, like, I know I matter to you, Lord. Like, I know I'm fearfully, wonderfully made. Like, I know what the word says. And God said, the problem with you, Nona, is it isn't what you know. It's what you believe. 
Wow. And I was like, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. You're like, <laughs> so oh, sure. I'm here having this conversation with God. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? And then God said so clearly to me, Sadie, God said, Nona, your problem is that so many people think insecurity is a question of ego. Mm. It's not about ego. It's about identity. Wow. And Nona, your identity is not secured to me. And that's why you're insecure. Wow. And that thing... When I tell you that thing settled on me like like a million pounds, like because it was so true. Like Dang. in that moment, it was like thirty years of me struggling with this issue. Yeah. It became so clear. It was like, wait a minute, Lord, are you saying that the reason why I feel like I don't measure up, the reason why I feel like I, I'm not good enough, the reason why I'm bothered that I wasn't invited is because I have secured my identity to something insecure. And wow. God was like, exactly. And so it was, wow. you know, a year, a year of work that I did, like hard work to recover ground, to really understand where did this start in my life? Like, how did my identity start to secure itself to the insecure foundation of people's approval, yep. for example? How did that happen? And going through that process, I learned so much that I was like, let me go ahead and start writing about this. And what That's happened cool. first is I got invited to um, speak at a church in South Carolina and I preached, I just called it Killing Comparison. I just preached Mm. this sermon on Killing Comparison. And when I tell you people were in tears, like they were in tears. And what I realized is I was like, Lord, what you've taught me about this issue is something that people need. And so that's when I started to write more about it. And that's, the result now That's so is the good. book that I'm super excited about. <laughs> well, praise God. Praise God. Because I know people are listening right now and they're like, dang, like as if God just said it to them, you know, that their identity is attached mm-hmm. to something that's insecure. I love this quote yeah. that you said. You said, instead of social media causing insecurity, I believe we bring our insecurity to social media. And I was like, oh, shoot, that is so good. <laughs> because so many people, we blame social media all day long on our problems. And, and I wrote this in my book. Social media is a reflection of you. Social media is only as healthy as you are. And so I just Mm -hmm. love that that thought that it's actually not the problem. It's it's your heart posture is is the problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I want I wanted to mention like so of course, you know, I, I work in social media. So for me, there's always been this question because people would say like, oh my gosh, I hate looking at my Instagram feed because I leave it feeling so bad about myself. But then you would have other people that would be like, oh my gosh, I love Instagram. I just feel so inspired. And, and what that really spoke to me is that comparison is, is kind of like neutral in the mm-hmm. one sense. It's neutral, but it becomes either healthy or toxic yeah. depending on the condition of our heart. It's good. And so like I was a microbiology and cell science major in college. And, you know, so a lot of mm-hmm. times when I think about things, I think about it in terms of physiology. And there is a process, a physiological process um, whereby we inhale air into our lungs, right? When mm-hmm. you inhale air into your lungs, it gives you life. It gives you vitality. That process is called inspiration. Mm. So when we look at somebody and seeing them succeed, you know, seeing them do well, it gives us life and energy and vitality. We're inspired by that. Mm -hmm. But the the opposite side, the opposite physiological process where we exhale air out of our lungs, that leads to death. That leads to fatigue. That process is called expiration. And this Mm. is why when somebody dies, it's called their expiration date. So when you look at somebody and you start to feel worse about yourself, you start to question your worth and your identity, that's expiration. That's toxic comparison. And so my contention with this book is that, look, comparison in and of itself is neutral, but it becomes toxic when we start to believe lies that counter the truth of God's word and who he says that we are, that's when it becomes toxic. Wow, that is so good. I'm like, everybody rewind that 30 seconds, listen to that one more time, because you just poured out so much wisdom in in one minute that could literally reshape the way people live their life. Mm. Um, 
so you are you're a go getter. I mean, clearly, I can't even I can't even repeat what you majored in because that was very smart. <laughs> I mean, like for real. I'm like I was gonna repeat it, but I'm like no, I'm not even gonna try. You you have this big job. You, you do all these things. I know you're a runner. You run a lot. I mean, you, you get stuff done. Like you do stuff, mm-hmm. but your identity is so rooted on the word. Um, so yeah. give me some advice on for people who, who do a lot of different things, who are successful in different areas, why is it important that your identity doesn't become about what you do, but it remains in who you are? Fall is here, fam, and I really cannot be more excited because that means fall outfits are back. Look, I got me some fall on right now. However, we've all been there staring at your closet and trying to figure out what you're gonna wear. And let's be real, it can be super frustrating when you can't find the right fit. But now you don't have to worry about that because Stitch Fix can refresh your wardrobe with all things fall right here, right now. Now let's be real, the thought of having your own personal expert stylist is pretty legit and Stitch Fix gives you that and an easy way to discover great new brands. Your stylist will learn about your taste and collaborate with you on your looks that you're gonna love. All you have to do is answer a few questions about where you typically like to shop, what you like to wear and your price range. Now those are all the good kind of questions that you're gonna need for the quiz and that's really it. Recently I got to pick out a few fall favorites and Stitch Fix makes it so easy. They've got you covered with over 1,000 brands and styles and wide ranges of sizes as well. So it's really friendly to everyone. So friends, I know you will discover pieces that you're gonna love and it only gets better. You get to try your pieces on at home before you buy them, which is so great. So there's no risk involved. You get to make sure that you love whatever you have. And if not, you just send it back. There's no subscription required. Plus shipping returns and exchanges are always free. So hey yo, that's pretty great. Right now, Stitch Fix is offering my listeners $20 off their first fit at stitchfix.com slash woe. That's stitchfix.com slash woe for $20 off today. Stitchfix.com slash woe. Oh, this is such a good question. This is such a good question because one of the insights that I had when I was you know, doing my own introspection into my own insecurity is what I realized is yes, I had achieved a lot. Yes, I was doing a lot, but It was because my ambition was actually fueled by my insecurity. Mm. And sometimes we do a lot and we achieve a lot, not because we are really excited about what we're doing, Mm. but because we have secured our identity to becoming that thing. Because we think once we get there, we'll finally matter and we'll finally have worth. And that was a lot of my issue, you know, pursuing career achievement being the first and the youngest executive and all of that, I wanted that because I felt like, man, if I could just be that, I'll finally matter. And I spend Mm. a lot of time in the book talking about the power of the voices that speak over us. Because when I was a child, I mean, I could I could never please my mom. Like there was nothing I could do that would make her see my worth. Mm. So she would be very quick to call me a derogatory name. Um, Mm. The only time she ever smiled was when I brought home straight A's on my report card. Wow. And what that did is that caused me to secure my identity to achievement. Yeah. And many people have done that to the point where if you don't get the thing you're pursuing, you feel worthless. You feel yeah. like a failure. And so for me, the journey really was I had to not just know what God said about me. I had to get it into my heart to the point where if I don't achieve the thing, I'm not broken by it because the thing is not who I am. I don't have to be, you know, the president of this. I don't have to get on this list. I don't have to get this award. If I do, that's great. But if I don't, that doesn't change my worth one ounce or one inch. But that comes with believing, truly believing what the word of God says about you. That's good. That's so good. Uh, You have a quote and it says, somewhere along the line, I had surrendered my purpose for performative applause. God had valued me before I even had the ability to perform my way into his love. I thought that was so good. And I can relate to that to some sense. I remember when I was younger, um, just feeling like, you know, if if I succeeded, if I did good, and my parents are awesome parents, but sometimes it would be like, oh, that's when my dad recognizes, you know? So I, I was like, okay, well, then I have to do really good in sports and I have to succeed in basketball and I have to throw the javelin really far. And then, then this was yeah, my yeah, way of yeah. performing because my dad would notice and he would say something. Mm-hmm. And if you don't 
recognize that correlation and, and what that's doing to you, you'll start to you'll start to correlate that with your relationship with God. You'll start to think, and you wrote this, and you just said this so beautifully. You'll start to think that you have to perform to earn God's attention, to earn God's yes. love, to earn God's affirmation. But the beautiful thing is, God loved you before you did a thing. He knit you together yes. in your mother's womb, and it's amazing that even with Jesus, uh, it was it was the same thing. You get to see that God formed such a relationship with His Son. And Jesus, even whenever he was 12, and we, we see Jesus learning about the scripture, reading about the scripture, all this stuff, and then he gets baptized, and the Lord says to him, God says, this is my son whom I'm well pleased, before he does a single thing. Then after that, yes. he goes crazy. He starts healing people, doing miracles, does this crazy ministry in three years, but before any of that, God said, this is my son with whom I'm pleased. And so it's just a great parallel to your story that, man, God's so proud of you. He sees you. He loves you before you do a thing for him. And if you don't recognize, if you start to act like that in relationships, then you'll certainly bring that into your relationship with God. Um, I love how you talk about just not letting other people's opinions be too much of like where you find your worth. And I I know I'm quoting so much of your book, but it was so good. It said, what might happen if you no longer waited on another human being to give you the thumbs up or thumbs down before you acted on what God has already said? Um, Do you Mm -hmm. feel like in life, like as far as things that you've done and whatnot, when did you get to the point where you were like, okay, this isn't about human approval. This is about what God's called me to do. I mean, honestly, it's literally been over the last few years. Like I, I could say, I could say with a, authority that, you know, looking back over my life and my career, and it's funny because so many people who have known me, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, the word they always would use to describe me is confident. Yeah. They're like, you just seem so confident. Yeah. But what they didn't realize is that on the inside of me, I was always searching and seeking for people's approval. Like it, it was to the point where um, it was people's facial expressions. Like mm, if, if somebody's yeah. facial expression looks like it was even questioning me, yeah. I would start to feel insecure. Like it would trigger my insecurity. Yep. And so it's literally over the last few years that God has really dealt with me on this issue because he was like, Nona, and, and going back to your, your earlier point, which was so beautiful about, you know, God approving of us before there was anything to approve of. If you read Jeremiah chapter one and five, a lot of times we look at that and we say, you know, oh, well, before God formed us in the womb, you know, he knew us and he had called us. And and that is true. But you have to like slow down for a second Hmm. because we think that means that in the womb we had purpose. That verse says before I formed you in the womb. Wow. Wow. Before the sperm met the egg. Wow. Before before you were conceived, God knew you and he called you. And so, no, your purpose didn't begin at conception. God decided you were necessary for creation before conception. And so taking that as a truth, it transformed my life, Sadie, because what I realized is my mother didn't want me. Hmm. And yes, that can become a burden where Hmm. you're like, I was unwanted literally from the beginning. Hmm. But even before the beginning, Hmm. God called me. So it doesn't matter what anybody says. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks, whether they agree or disagree. God decided before sperm met egg that I was necessary for creation. And so people may disapprove of me. They may disapprove of you. But God approved of you to the point where even if you were unwanted, you're still here (laughs) by his grace. It's so good. And and I think that so many people, it's like, it's like, you know, you, you hear those verses and, and to some extent, if you grew up in the church and they become so familiar to you, you know, and mm-hmm. I love that you said, slow down a minute, like think about what that means for your life and like, let that change everything about who you are. Let that be above what anyone has ever spoken over you. Let that be above and more of a priority than anything you've ever believed about yourself that God knew you and he decided mm-hmm. that you were worth coming into this time of history for for some reason yeah. for some purpose and like that really does change your life you know i think mm-hmm. that people think like 
reading your Bible is just something that you have to do or something you should do or reading your Bible is just like, oh yeah, that's a good verse. But no, reading your Bible is transformative. Reading your Bible is awakening awakening your soul to who you were created to be. Do you think, um, this is just kind of a, a deep random question, but do you think maybe because that is true, that God knew us before he formed us, that that's why in everybody's heart, no matter if they're a Christian or not, there's a longing for something more you know, because I mean, you yes. can't deny, like, even if you don't believe in God, you can't deny that, that your soul longs for something more than this earth. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I think that's why there's so much pursuit. So for example, I, you know, I work in the tech sector. And if you know anything about the, <laughs> the demographics of the tech sector, it's not a very faith friendly sector. So yeah. I think the last stat I saw was like 80% of people who work in tech are either atheist or agnostic. Wow. And yet the tech sector is one of the most productive, innovative sectors in the world. They're constantly pushing for new and greater. Mm -hmm. They're constantly thinking about scale. And uh, I was in a meeting, so, you know, CEO of of Meta is Mark Zuckerberg. And, um, you know, for many years he was atheist. Well, I was in a meeting with uh, with him. This was maybe about a month, month and a half ago. And somebody asked the question like, hey, you know, what, what book are you reading right now to really inspire your thinking about the future? And he said, the Bible. Wow. He said, the Bible. Because for him, the creation story is all about creating something incredible from nothing. And wow. that's what tech is. And the reason why I say that is because even people who say they don't have a sense of God, don't believe in God, they're constantly trying to pursue who God is in their own way. And that's exactly what he was saying. And so, yes, I think on the inside of us, whether we believe the truth of God or not, there's a pursuit of him because that is in our spiritual DNA. Friends and fam, y'all know how important it is to me to maintain good health. So it's really hard though whenever you're on the go and you're trying to be healthy, especially whenever you have a one-year-old who has a lot of energy and making healthy decisions can be hard because that's kind of the last thing you're you're putting into place for you. But I have a way to make it easy. Um, AG1 by Athletic Greens has made it so easy and an incredible choice for Christian and I to actually get our greens and all the stuff we need on the go. Our greens, our vitamins, all the things. AG1 makes it easy because it helps you maintain energy levels and maintain healthy habits in just one time tasty scoop of AG1. You can actually get 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients. So whether you're looking to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, boost your energy, or improve your gut health, AG1 has got you covered. One thing that I do not like is a bunch of products or pills to maintain those vitamin or energy levels because who does? I mean, you got so much to keep up with, but it's so awesome to have AG1 because it replaces all of those with just one drink that is um, not only good for you, but it also tastes good, which is pretty rare when it comes to lots of vitamins. Um, So if you're curious if this will work for your lifestyle, I can just go ahead and tell you it will, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still managing to taste good. So after Christian and I tried it, we actually got his family hooked on it too because it's a great thing to even travel with. They have travel packs as well. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you an immune-supporting free one-year supply of vitamin D, which is so awesome, and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit athleticgreens.com slash woe today. Again, just simply visit athleticgreens.com slash woe to take control of your health and give AG1 a try. That's good. Come on. That is good, man. I'm glad I asked the question. Um, <laughs> that's so good. Okay, so what I love about this, too, is that your your backstory is, uh, I mean, it's it's big. It's heavy. The fact that, you know, you, your mom um, didn't, didn't want you and you walked through that hard story. But now you're talking about comparison. And, and I think it's really actually cool to hear you say those two things because I think a lot of people think comparison is not a big issue you know it's like Mm -hmm. comparison just seems like a small sin if you will and if you're only listening and watching my 
quotations are going up because there's no small sin, right? It's like, oh, well, it's mm-hmm. just comparison. Like, don't we all compare ourselves or it's just jealousy or it's just envy or it's just whatever. Yeah. And there's just these little things and it's not that big of a deal. Like it would maybe be expected that you would come on here and talk about um, abuse, you know, which you have mm-hmm. talked about some and I'm sure you talk about other contexts, but it's that important to you that you tackle the topic of comparison. So oh, yeah. talk to us a little bit about why it is a big deal if you're struggling with comparison and it's actually not okay. Because I remember there was a moment for me that I had to wake up because I was like, there were certain sins in my life or things in my life that I was like, well, it's fine because everybody does it. And then I had to realize, right. actually, it's not fine because it's not who I'm called to be. And it's less than who God yes. created me to be. And so talk to us about waking up to the reality that actually it's not okay. Oh my goodness. Let me tell you the reason why toxic comparison is so important as to focus on is because I believe that toxic comparison is the thing that actually robs us of our purpose. Hmm. I believe that wow. it's the thing wow. that actually causes us to disqualify ourselves from the reason we were created. And and I'll give you a personal example. So, um, you know, pandemic's happening, you know, everybody has all this free time on their hands. And so a bunch of people were starting, you know, uh, Facebook live shows, they were doing, you know, new podcasts, and there was all this stuff happening. And I started to see like a bunch of my friends who were doing this. I was like, maybe I should do that too. Now, here's the thing. I don't have a passion for that (laughs) at all. Like I love to, like, I love this stuff. I love having conversations with people, but I'm not the one that just loves to think about what am I going to talk about on a podcast? How are we going to timeline yep. this out? All this yep. stuff. But I did it because I saw other people doing it. And then I had other people telling me, oh, you should start a podcast. I did this thing. Girl, that thing, it made me so exhausted. I was so <laughs> tired of all the work. And, and, and I bring this up because I believe I wasted so much time and energy on that. God never graced me for that. He didn't yeah. call me yeah. to that. And so here I am doing this thing because I was comparing myself to other people. Yeah. And God is like, Nona, I called you in a whole other direction. That's right. And you're doing this thing just because you see other people doing it. And so that's why to me, it's so important to identify it and, and really confront it it's and good. get free from it. Because there are many people who were born an original and they're going to die a duplicate. Wow. And God did not create us. Oof to die a duplicate because he doesn't make duplicates. He doesn't make extras. He gave us each a unique purpose. Yep. And so, to yeah, that's the reason why it's important. Dang, <laughs> I'm like, say it again. There will be many people who will be born an original and die a duplicate. Oh my gosh, that is that shook me. I mean, because our whole ministry is live original. I literally have a big thing that says original behind me. And I'm like, yeah. and for me, like my goal and a lot of what I'm called to do is to go remind people who they were originally created to yes. be because I think people yeah. think, oh, well, who I'm originally created to be is given to me. So I have that. But some of you need to be reminded of that because you've mm-hmm. gotten away from that. It is possible for you to get away from that original person you were created to be and it takes humility and it takes a purification Mm. in the Lord to get back to that childlike Mm. faith that he created you to have so I just love that girl you you are a preacher (laughs) I mean I listened to your sermon this morning and I was on fire and now hearing you talk but it's just it's what's inside of you and and you actually talk about this in Proverbs 23 7 as he thinks in Mm. his heart so he is And I, mean. I, I love that verse as well. That that verse has convicted me because for me, because I do talk so much on a microphone, I'm like, whoa, I better make sure my heart is pure because another verse is verses yes. that say, from the heart so the mouth shall speak, yes. you know? So I'm like, whatever's in me is going to come out. You mm-hmm. obviously, um, it, it's so obvious for you because you get in the situation and I'm throwing random questions at you. I didn't send you the questions beforehand. And it's just truth bomb, truth bomb, truth Truth bomb. <laughs> so talk to me about making your heart pure. Talk to me about, um, you know, as he thinks. Um, so yeah. in his heart, so he is. Talk to me about the way that you think, your thoughts, what you put in, and uh, just your intentionality with, with what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think it's so important for us to understand that even in that verse where it says, 
as he thinks in his heart, so is he. That word think is also translated meditate. Mm. And when we meditate, we give intentional, uh, intentional mental focus to something. When you give intentional mental focus to something, what happens is it becomes embedded in your heart. The way that we even form our beliefs is that we give intentional mental focus to it. I'll give you an example. So um, I, I talk a little bit in the book about how I lost 100 pounds and I've kept it off for many years now. I just did like diet and exercise. But before that, I felt like I could not lose weight. I was, I was like, I'll never lose weight. I tried, you know, fad diets, it would never work. I gave intentional mental focus to what I couldn't do. And because of that, I believed that there was no way for me to change my condition. It wasn't until I actually gave intentional mental focus to the people who were able to lose the weight and actually learn from them that I started to change what I believed was possible for me. Mm. And so when you think about that scripture and it says, as you think in your heart, so are you, as you intentionally focus, yeah. as you intentionally give your mental strength to something, you will become it because you will believe it. Wow. And so getting free from toxic comparison, it really requires giving that intentional mental focus to what are the things that are triggering my insecurity? What are the things that when I see it, I start to think like, well, why can't I be like that? Mm -hmm. Why are they always winning and I'm losing? Yeah. You know, why am I not good enough? What are those things? Intentionally focus on that because once you're aware of it, then you can move to the next step of actually pursuing freedom from it. But we can't get free from what we don't acknowledge. Mm. And our heart is only going to reflect what we spend our time meditating on. Yep. Girl, that is so true. That is so, <laughs> I'm just like, yes. I'm just like, I feel like we're just at coffee right now. And everybody's watching me just go, <laughs> yes, yes. That's so good. I'm like, say it. It's great. Oh, and the last okay. thing I want to ask you about is just the difference between, you talk about this, manufactured significance and real significance. Because I, have, I think a lot of people are, are running after this manufactured significance. And, and that's why they're waking up in the morning and they're not feeling like they have purpose. And they're not feeling like they have, um, you know, they're not doing what they're called to do because, but yet they're doing stuff. And they're like, wait, why, yes. why am I, what am I missing here? Um, speak to mm -hmm. that a little bit, just as we close about actually going for things that matter. Yeah. Well, I think th the reason why I, <laughs> I talked about this is so several years ago, um, God convicted me of something. Um, I was, you know, starting out at then what was called Facebook. And, you know, I was always connecting with very like famous people. And there was this one particular event that I went to and there were famous people there. And, you know, we were like, you know, taking pictures and I was taking selfies. And I posted a selfie on Instagram with someone. I don't even remember who it was. And uh, the Lord convicted me. Like the moment I posted it, God said, why did you just post that? Are you trying to get people to think you matter because you took a picture with someone who actually matters? Dang. <laughs> and I was like, wait, ah. what? And, and the Lord said to me at that point, the Lord said to me, Nona, if you want to get free from insecurity, you're going to have to stop posting pictures with famous people. Hmm. And I was like, but Lord, what does that have to do with anything? Hmm. And God said, when you do that, you're trying to manufacture significance. Hmm. So when you manufacture significance, it's basically significance by proxy. Hmm. It's like, see, I matter because of who I know, hmm. or I matter because of the title I wear. Yeah. I matter because of how I look. I matter because I'm married or because I'm in a relationship. Yeah. I matter because of something external to me. Yeah. And I'm telling you about this thing so that you will think I matter too. That's how we manufacture it. True significance, true significance is what we have in the absence of any of that. That's right. Whether I have a college degree or not, whether I have a big title or not, whether I have a lot of money or not, whether I'm in a relationship or not, there is a fundamental significance that I have. And it goes back to the conversation we just had. Before you were even formed yep. in your mother's womb, you already were significant. Yep. God decided that then. And once you believe that, you don't need any proximate you know, estimations 
of your significance yeah. anymore. And so now if you look at my social, like I post what I like, mm -hmm. I don't post to be like, look at me. It's like, <laughs> there's plenty of that. Just post what you like yeah. instead of trying to get people to think you matter because of what you share. That's so good. That's so good. I love that because I think a lot of people, it's like the missing piece of the puzzle. They're like, I have all this stuff. Why do I not feel significant? I have all the That's famous it. people around me. I have the followers. I have the yeah. um, the job title. I have the husband. I have the boyfriend. I have the baby. I have yeah. whatever it is that they thought that was going to do it for them. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, why do I still not feel significant? And it's because nothing that you can get mm -hmm. can make you feel more significant than what God's already given mm -hmm. you and, and who you Amen. are. And so, man, mm -hmm. Nona, this was awesome. I am so <laughs> glad we had this conversation. And if I'm not mistaken, you're about to be over in the LO Sister app mentoring and bringing some more wisdom, which we're so excited about. And if you yeah. like this conversation, which I can't imagine anyone not, go buy her book, <laughs> Killing Comparison. Um, it is, gosh, this is just this is just highlighting some of the surfaces, okay? Like, you got to go deep. You got to go in. You got to go read the book, get the whole story, get all the advice, because she has so much to give. No, no, it was so fun talking to you, and I'm just so thankful to be your friend. Oh, thank you, Sadie. Love you so much. Thank you for your ministry and for having me. This has been so fun. Thank you. Love you, too cheering you on.